Hi, everyone. We're joined once more by Scott Snyder to discuss Absolute Batman, DC All In, all kinds of things. We're both a little frazzled because it was a bit of a scramble to make this happen, but it happened. So that's awesome. <laughs> Yes, I'm so grateful to be back on, Sasha. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for coming on. I was really excited to discuss it, especially after it dropped. And now people have seen it because you have been running the gauntlet and just dropping all kinds of promo and all kinds of things. So how has that been? How much of that has been you, like led by you? Uh, I mean, it's me. I'm, I like, I'll be an attention horror when I really love a book. Um, so I mean, and I, I love all of them differently, but you try, I think like the key to publicity for me over the years is to, to try and be honest with fans. And if a book is really, is sort of a, a, you know, a, one of those ones like this, that, that carries or is part of a really big initiative and it really needs to spearhead some stuff and announce the priorities of everything then i don't mind being like a juggling bear on a unicycle and do everything because i love the book azarello and other guys will make fun of me a lot and be like oh you're like pt barnum or doing that. i really i honestly i i was super anxious about that stuff when i started and now i really i've come to really enjoy it because i'm proud of the work i'm really proud of the books and not just mine and nick's but absolute wonder woman the main line so it's been it's fun i like it i don't mind it i like i like getting to talk to people so you were saying that the numbers have been really good they've just been climbing up there which is exciting to hear yeah i honestly like i had i know it sounds like uh fake modesty but i mean it's like a survival mechanism more than anything is to like go in with really low expectations at this point so DC had numbers that they had in mind. And then I had like lower numbers in my mind, which were like, hopefully it will just hit this. So to see it, you know, the first printing was 250 and then that sold out. And then we're getting word now that it's probably going to go to a third. And so I'm just overwhelmed. Like I, I've never expected it to, to hit those kinds of numbers. And uh, it's like the, yeah, it's up there with the biggest stuff I've done. And then the, the nicer part of all of that is just seeing the, the response to the other books honestly mm -hmm. is is like exciting as the response to our book which is absolute wonder woman's over 150 superman absolute superman's headed in that direction even though it's not till november and mm -hmm. it, there just seems to be a real excitement about not just the absolute line but dc comics in general and i think it speaks to a larger excitement in comics right now that's palpable like all across the whole all across the I world. would agree. There's definitely an energy. I was talking about on stream a few days ago and people were like, no, you're just biased because you're in the space. I'm like, no, like there is, there really is more talk, more just discussion and more kind of classic style discussions that you yeah. used to see more of like people arguing about logos and swords and all of those <laughs> kind of things. And I think it's really fun. It's been really cool to see that manifest. And yeah. one of the things I saw in the comments was people saying, they're like, I went to the store and it was sold out and I have to wait to get it. I'm like, that's such a cool energy. So is anything in the reaction surprised you? Yeah, the, honestly, I, 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 um, the level of sales like definitely surprised me like on my kids. I did not expect that. But, um, even more than that, just the, I was really hoping that people would see it as a, as a doorway to a larger, a larger, um, moment in comics for DC in particular, but for Marvel too, which is, it is, it is to me, like, like you're saying a moment when it feels like after like 10 years of comics, you know, being connected to comic book movies in all kinds of good ways too. Mm -hmm. I just mean being associated with those things, reacting to those things, producing material for those things and being independent, but there's always kind of this intertwining and, and internally at the companies, there's been a, a real intertwining over those years. Mm -hmm. It feels like everybody, both fans, creators, editors, they're excited to be able to be like, you know what? There have been these amazing cinematic and televisual universes. Let's actually all come home and remind people why this is where these characters live their best stories and create the material for those things. And we're going to allow creators to take bigger swings than we have in a while. And I think you see that all across the board. Like with what Dan has been, Dan uh, Warren Johnson has been able to do on Transformers and what they're doing with GI Joe. And, you know, mixing it with with Transformers, like it's awesome. And what they're doing with Turtles. Turtles was the biggest selling book of the year, um, you know, with, with Jason. And they're letting creators try things that they might not have let them try a few years ago, I think, to be able to say, 
let's remind people how epic these characters can be in this medium. And so there's a real attraction all of a sudden with Ultimates, not mm -hmm. just Ultimate Spider-Man, which is amazing with John and, and everyone, but Ultimates by Dennis, like, you know, and, and real sort of um, interesting swing books like Ultimate X-Men. It's just cool. You know, it feels like a moment where it's like, there's an energy to the market. Books are selling well too. There's a kind of, there's an influx of, of readership, I think again, because they've, They've kind of come home after a while. There's a nostalgia mm -hmm. and a new readers. I don't know. I'm, I feel like there's the energy to the to the market right now. And I think the sales are bearing that out with this stuff. So it's nice to see. And there's new people coming in too, which is a lot of fun. It's exciting because sometimes I get comments where it's like, I don't read them. I like listening to people talk about them. I'm like, I would like you to read them as well because it's fun talking about them. But it's even more fun to read them. So, <laughs> Yeah. And it's just like. I don't know. It's like after a lot of years, there's just been a lot of change in comics over the last 10 years, right? There's been like in the license space with Marvel mm -hmm. and DC being, we talked about it last time, but being acquired by bigger and bigger companies and, and in the indie space where there was all of a sudden a way to make a living doing indie comics because The Walking Dead paved the way for that, where there was a huge readership at Image. And then suddenly you could do you could get your prop all your books optioned because there was a streaming war going on. And mm -hmm. so there were all these kind of ways of making comics that that, you know, were exciting and different and have done some of them are some of my favorite ones. And 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 now it also feels like those things still exist, but it also just feels like we all know how to use them or do them in the ways that we like. We've all found we've all found our comfort zone with everything. And so it feels like a kind of moment when creators are like, you know what? Like I might go back and do that Superman story. <laughs> or you know what? Mm -hmm. I might go back. And not like one I wanted to do 10 years ago. I want to go and remind people why these characters can always be exciting and renewed and that. So I don't know. I feel I feel an electricity to it. And I think the lines, the, the Comic-Con seeing like it, it hit me last year at New York Comic-Con where I went and it was way busier than I'd, I'd seen mm -hmm. it. And it was just like, and San Diego was that way too, where you were like, people want to be excited again by comics. Mm -hmm. They're desperate for it. They want to go to the store every week, you know? I imagine the coming con is going to be probably quite exciting as well, especially now that things are are coming out and people are seeing them. And I, I wanted to ask now that we can actually talk about because they're yeah. spoilers and everything and it's it's free to discuss. What was the favorite change that you made, the biggest swing that you felt you took? That's that's a great question. I mean, the biggest swing, the thing that I'm proudest of is honestly the two things. Like the the first really is just the inversion. Like the idea for me, I love writing Bruce as somebody who's got resources and the cars are really fun and the planes are fun in the cave, but it really feels like making him a reflection of the thing that I see that's exciting in in my kids' generation, which is a refusal to accept things the way they are. And that might mean protest, that might mean idealism, that might mean, you know, whatever, it, like, but they're passionate about not accepting things the way they are and wanting to, to find their own way, of making things better, even that means breaking some things. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting, you know, you see that and you're like, hopefully they'll they'll sort of, you know, they'll, they will be able to affect some kind of, you know, real impact. And so this Batman is based on that spirit. I'm not writing this Batman as me. Like I think I said to you last time, I'm writing this Batman as the way I see my kids, my kids' generation. I'm more like Alfred, who's like watching and being like, this is a tough world, you know, for you, but I want to protect you. But, um, and so I love that. It makes it so new. And it opens up all these doorways for me to be like, God, it's not, he inspires me is what's really fun. He's not a proxy to me making me brave. It's more like watching someone go out there with an attitude that is young, whereas mine is, is more skeptical and making me inspired, you know, the way Alfred um, is by Bruce in the book mm -hmm. too. So that, and then the second thing honestly is the way he's formed. I mean, we didn't talk about it last time because, but you know, I'm really excited that DC let us change his um, his parents' death. You know, it was the thing. It came for it was it was crucial to me when I pitched the book. Like my the way I wasn't going to do the book unless I could really make it something that I felt was relevant. Um, and mm -hmm. again, it doesn't have to be some explicit reflection of the world or or hyper political or any of that stuff. But uh, you know, Batman exists to make us brave in the face of the things that we're scared of. And ultimately, like what thing is a kid 
growing up these days afraid of that would take away his his or her parents like and what things do they experience that feel now and new and you know taking my five-year-old to daycare to their you know pre-k and there's an escape mm -hmm. window when you walk in and that that's just a different world and it doesn't mean you have a prescriptive answer you know the book does the book does sort of talk about um the need like later in the later in the in the run i won't give away too much but in issue two you see that he has he visits joe chill sometimes in prison and you don't mm. know what they say to each other it's part of the part of a mystery but what the book is prescribing and what you the other thing i'm really like i'm proud of about this approach is that um there's an issue four issue four is like all about it sounds funny, but it's all about like why the chest emblem is so big and why mm -hmm. he's so big. Um, and it's about this Batman growing up in this world, needing to be bigger in all kinds of ways, need to think bigger, needing to act bigger, needing to um, be more broad in his approach. And so that element of, of being able to introduce, you know, a shooting, a mass shooting is something that forms Batman just felt so right. It just feels like the thing that would make somebody want to stop this thing from happening again, want to stop violence from being enacted randomly and on kids and not use guns, not be lethal. It just felt so right for it mm -hmm. um, that I, it was a real, it was crucial to me to be able to include that when I decided I was going to do the book. I was really impressed with the balance of the new things with some of the nods to the past lore, because at his core, he still felt very much like Batman in essence. And how difficult was it to maintain that? Was that something you were conscious of? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, I was, I was conscious, you know, I, I the best advice I ever got, honestly, going on Batman was Grant Morrison, who was like, the first year when I was doing it, he, he, I bumped into him at um, San Diego and I was like a brand newbie and I was on detective and I was like, what am I doing with, how am I going to pull this off? And he was like, what you need to do is you need to give your version of Batman a birth and a death. Like imagine how his childhood was before he's Batman, everything after. And then how does he die? How does he end his time as Batman? And if you can do that, it will feel like you, it's a creator own character. And because the pressure of writing Batman is like you're saying, always trying to be true to what's come before and to, to, you know, make sure you're not offending and make sure it's, you know, it's, uh, it fits. And if you get caught up in that too much, like it's crushing the weight of the legacy of this character is crushing. And so hearing that from Grant was like, okay, I'm going to, he's mine. This version I know better than anyone. Cause I know the secret, you know, the secret stories of his childhood. And I know what he's going to do when he's an old man. And it freed me up to sort of be like, okay, I'm just going to take the leap and be like, if I've loved Batman my whole life, hopefully it's baked into the DNA of this character mm -hmm. that I'm making, that it will be true to core enough. And so I tried to approach it that way here too, and be like, okay, I don't know if anyone's going to go for some of this stuff, but it feels right to me for this version of Batman. And you know, you just burn him down. I remember saying last time, but like the, the thing we asked people in the absolute universe to do was like burn the character down to their core thing. Like, what are mm -hmm. they to you? The simplest thing. And then rebuild them using all the things in their mythology and in the world that you think make them even more exciting than they, they are to you in the classic universe. And so for Batman, that was like this kid that suffers this terrible trauma and then uses it as fuel to make sure that doesn't happen to other people and make the world better. Everything else is malleable. And so, yeah, it was like just trying to keep that compass. Like this is, this is a new version. I know his beginning. I know his mm -hmm. end when he's old and trust it. And Nick is on board with it. And then you just kind of go with it. There's a lot I was worried people would hate. I mean, from the arm, he chops off people's hands, which I knew. And then the shooting, I was worried people would hate. And the, But I believe, you know, you're worried to a point and you're just like, I love it. And I'm just going to mm -hmm. go for it because I believe in it. No, it hits a point where, you know, there's nothing else you can do. It's going out there and then you just have to wait and see. And the response, I find that part kind of fun. You know, when you put something out there and seeing ultimately at the end, how people respond to it and now that those things you were worried about like what how did that go for those parts it's gone like knock on wood like 
you know, I thought there'd be a lot more um, pushback, honestly, both internally at DC and then out in the world, like the smallest things. Like I was waiting for the call. That's like, you can't have the title page be a hand with a gun because mm -hmm. I didn't think they'd let us do that. I was waiting for the, you can't chop off this dude's hand. I was waiting for the Batman can't curse because they're not allowed to curse in the main universe. So, mm -hmm. you know, and Bruce does throw some F-bombs, although they're all Grom, what are they called? Gromlicks. Gromlicks, so, yeah. <laughs> so, but like all of that, I was like waiting for the, you can't do this. And they, they never said it. And uh, it was, I'm very grateful for that. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of things I thought people would maybe react to more strongly. And I'm really glad that they seem into it. I'm waiting for it still. I'm like, tomorrow maybe the backlash. I'm like, the backlash will come the next week or next issue maybe or <laughs> but you know was the logo one of those things you were the expecting? logo was definitely yes yeah the logo the logo it was funny because like they they called me and were like listen there's this whole thing online about the logo and I was like okay what is it and you're like people are really mad about it and it was a misunderstanding because people thought that it was they someone tweeted to james gunn that it was like the real logo of the main batman and he said you know whatever and uh i was like this is awesome you know great and they were like well we can we want you to do a story to like set the record straight so to be like this is why this is and i was like honestly the only thing I'm worried about is that Nick is hurt. Like if Nick's feelings are hurt, then, but I called Nick and he was laughing. He was like, this is awesome. And I was like, great. So let's just make it a joke and be like for every, every, all the, every time you write something, uh, every, for every hate, every bit of hate it gets, it grows one inch bigger, you know, the emblem. And, and he's a great partner with that too, where I think the key to this stuff really is like, look, I've, you know, I'm, I have certainly have my insecurities and my, my worries where I'm like, did I completely fuck this up and I'll call a friend, but you got to have like a core confidence and be like, if, if you love this thing, that's the whole, that's what writing is, right? If you love it and you're putting yourself into it and being like, I care about this. And I think this is whether it's licensed or not. Um, does anyone else feel this way? The way I feel that's, and if you're not confident in that, you, you can't write, you know, cause it's, it, that's what makes it really you know, connect is it's saying, does anyone else feel this Batman speaks to them? Because this is the way I feel Batman would work right now. You know, this is, this is how to make him feel so real to me the way dark Knight felt so real to me in 20, um, in, um, you know, uh, 1986. And not that this is as good as that or anything. I just mean the goal is to try and make it feel as like immediate and vibrant and resonant as that. And the only way to do that is to take the risk to be like, you know, I'm putting everything of I care about or I'm afraid about in the book. Mm -hmm. You you can get really hurt that way too. People can turn around and hate it. And then you're like, I'm all alone. <laughs> Nobody feels the way I feel. But you know, you gotta you gotta do it. So that's what I'd say to people out there is like you have to just like take Grant's advice, write it like a character you made up, put everything, you know, you're afraid to put on the page on the page and take the swing, you know. There's no point in coming in being like, what's a plot? for Batman that hasn't been done because probably it's been done. And secondly, like that's not how you do anything special or original, you know, it doesn't work that way. In my opinion, like it's, what is the thing I'm afraid of or hopeful about? How do I build a story out of that, that Batman can engage in and either be frightened with me or brave or whatever. How did that work for reinventing and reimagining his villains? I mean, if some of them end up becoming villains. Well, that it's funny. It's still evolving. Like, for his villains, I kept trying to get them. I, I tried a lot, actually. Like, because the, the one of the things with the book that's fun is like I was talking to Nick and I was like, we started talking about the book well over a year ago. So he signed on to do it before right around San Diego of last year. So a year and four months ago or whatever, three months ago. Um, and so we've been talking about it ever since. And there was already like a loose outline then. Um, but back then I was like, OK, so he you see he's friends with these guys. And in the first arc, they all get turned into villains, you know, all mm. his friends. And then I had so much fun writing them and playing with them. I was like, God, maybe these aren't his villains for a while. You know what I mean? Like, they're definitely, don't worry. Like, they're they're going to become the people you expect, at least in terms of their disfigurements and all that. That's all coming down the line in this story. I know where it happens now. But um, 
they were the people I thought would be the villains early. And then I fell in love with the friendships that they have and the, and the tension that they have, because there's characters like Oswald, you'll see an issue too. They play a, I'm spoiling stuff again, but they have a poker game that Bruce gets invited to in issue one. And then in issue two, you see him go to this poker game. So again, spoiler, sorry. But <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes I've like ever written in a Batman comic. And it's like him and Edward Nigma and Oswald Cobblepot and Harvey Dent and Waylon Jones all sitting around playing cards with a seat for Selena who isn't there because mm -hmm. they all grew up together. And um, their dialogue, I mean, just writing it where it's like, Waylon is like, look at this. You finally came. I'm taking a picture, you know, and Harvey Dent's like, I'm not taking a picture with this asshole, like meaning Oswald. And he's like, oh, look at you, you fucking two face. Now that you're all like you work in the DA's office, you think you're such a hot shot. You know what I mean? And whatever. Mm -hmm. And Eddie's like, will you guys shut up? I can't even count cards. You know, it's just like, <laughs> and it's just fun. Like it just became so um, just so exciting. You know, like it's it's just everything is new. You know, it really is. Like, and forgive me if I said this to you last time, but um, did I mention like there's a scene that I love in my run with Craig in one of our last arcs that, you know, sometimes my favorite scenes are not everybody else's favorite scenes, but yeah. some of them are like the big crazy motorcycles and whatever. But sometimes the most favorite ones are like the quiet ones where like the for me, there's one scene where Bruce has been returned to being Bruce Wayne in our last arc in Super Heavy. And he doesn't remember being Batman or how to be Batman. And he finds out he used to be Batman. And he doesn't know what to do. And he sits on a bench and this guy sits next to him and it's Joker. Mm -hmm. And Joker has also been returned to human form and doesn't seemingly doesn't remember he was Joker. And the two of them just have this conversation at this pond on a bench in a park. And it leads them to sort of understand they need to go back and do the things they do in their own weird way. And mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite scenes because it, when you find something that can like cut to the core of how you believe the mythology, what it means, and then also do it in a way that you haven't seen, mm -hmm. there's just a thrill. And this whole series feels like that where it's all uncharted territory, you know, like again, spoiler, but if you, you know, for this issue, but um, we're already talking about it. So <laughs> But his mother is alive, Martha, and that was a big decision. And I almost went back on it after um, I almost went back on it after Ultimate Spider-Man came out because we had already I had already written the issue; it was already being drawn, you know, and that because like all of this was signed up, you know, again, mm -hmm. like it was New York last year it was we were locked in. And so when Uncle Ben and that stuff, when that was there, I was like, maybe I change it. But I loved I just love their relationship so much. And it's so mm -hmm. different that he has someone because he doesn't have Alfred. And so he doesn't have anyone to talk mm -hmm. to as Bruce and making him more vulnerable felt. And so everything is new like that. Like his mom's alive. His villains are his friends. You know, again, Joker has a whole new role. He's going to not going to come in for a while, but he lurks mm -hmm. in the background and there's all these villains coming as, as Bruce won't stop. And Alfred keeps telling him, this isn't a normal Batman story. Like you don't win. Like, the more you, someone with nothing, go up against these people that I know from around the world, the more they'll send at you and they have endless resources. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to win where you shine a bat signal and inspire everybody and everyone stands up for you. And, you know, and Bruce is like, I still am going to do it. So I don't care. But um, mm -hmm. it's made a whole new context to create villains like Bane and all these characters coming later it's fun and bane i can't i'm we're just talking to nick last night at the signing where i was like he's got to be bigger than bruce but <laughs> yeah I'm like, i was like what is that like 10 feet tall and like <laughs> yes i was like yes i want him to be huge like i i want bruce to be dwarfed by somebody so i was like bane will be a lot of fun you know well some people were joking they're like i bet he'll be tiny so i think he'll be nice to see that he's huge yeah, I mean, I still feel like I know, like I had that thought too. I'm like, what if he's just like this tiny dude that runs around <laughs> in the mask and like jumps on Batman? But, <laughs> but I, it just felt like, no, you know what? I don't know where my head's at. My gut says go even bigger with Bane. So he's just like a monster, you know? Mm -hmm. Was there anybody that you didn't want to use? Like, did you ever think about not using the Joker at all or? Yeah. The, well, the Joker is where that was the skeleton key to me that sealed the whole series on the other side. So it really was like it wasn't 
the way it came to me was like, I want Bruce to be inspiring in this. And so I was like, well, what do my kids look up to? What are they inspired by? They're not inspired by generational billionaires. And it was like, okay, so Bruce, Bruce will be someone working class who comes up with circumstances against him. And it was like, well, if that's the case, then he's kind of going up against the system and order and all the things he stands for in the main universe. He's kind of the chaos, the monkey wrench. And then it hit me. And I was like, well, that makes Joker those things. Cause Joker to me, the way I've always played Joker, um, my like personal thesis on him is that he's sort of like a Joker card, you know, mm -hmm. where in a deck, if you're playing cards, the Joker, you know, conventionally can take on any value that you decide it takes on for you to get a winning hand. And so with the way Joker sees himself is that he is like the hand to the king. He's the jester to the king in the, the jester often like delivered bad news to the king mm -hmm. in the old days and he did it because he could make him laugh but he did it because he needed to face it and so joker really believes himself to be you know in the main universe like and meta metaphorically the way i see him whether he knows it or not is as the thing that shapes itself into whatever like fear whatever thing will challenge batman the most like the same way a joker card can take on any value it's about his value is I'm going to be the thing that will be your hardest challenge, the thing that you're most afraid of, the thing that represents everything you don't want to see and fight. And so it was like, what is he here? Well, he's Bruce Wayne. Like he's, he's the generational billionaire. He's the one that has all of the resources. He's the one that's the system and order and has endless, you know, uh, endless material at his disposal and he's the one that's trained around the world he's gone with henry ducar and knows mm -hmm. detection and he knows how to fight and he's like ever he's like you know it's like the kid that it's like rocky versus drago you know what i mean or someone mm -hmm. that has like all the all the all the the benefits so that's how he came to be and then i really struggled with it though because i was like do i do i just leave him out for like a year and not mention him at all and if I have like one thing about the whole first issue that um, I went back and forth on the most, mm -hmm. uh, it was that. It was, do I include that on the last page or do I save it for another issue? And I really, I still am a little torn, but James Tynan, I showed him the book and he was like, put it in because it completes the thought. It completes the thesis. It's like a trailer for the series that mm -hmm. explains everything you're thinking in one issue. And then you can you know, you can hold him out for later because I don't have any real interest. I mean, I know when he comes to Gotham and when he comes to Gotham, it's going to be crazy. And he has the cave and he has the manor and he has the cars and he has all of that stuff. And he's not Joker with like a long white face. He's like a handsome, I mean, he has, a, he has a messed up face, but I'm not going to spoil it how, <laughs> how he has it or how, where it, like why he doesn't look that way on mm -hmm. the surface right now, but it's all there. Like, and so, but he is like, you know, he's a scary dude, man. He's way scarier than I've written him in a while. I mean, I've always enjoyed him for his terror, straight up terror. And he, this guy is terrifying and not, he's not like some satire. There's no, like, he's not like Elon Musk making, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not the commentary. The commentary is like, there are people who, you know, are, are, have tremendous power who are really just nihilistic and don't care about anybody but themselves. And, will kill you or you know will don't don't care if people die right and left if it makes them one penny hence the penny in the cave mm -hmm. you know all that stuff and so that's that's where i'm headed with it and i, mm -hmm. I love it like i can't wait for him to come to town but i don't want him to come to town <laughs> so we got we have some <laughs> we have some road to drive before he comes but i'm kind of considering doing an issue about him somewhere around issue six or seven just to show like an interstitial issue between arcs to just sort of like give you hints about him and mm -hmm. what he, or how he formed. And I'll, I might do that. I can say from the response that my audience had, they were definitely very curious about this version. I saw way more of that than the reverse sentiment of they wished he hadn't been there. So I think people would definitely take to that. Yeah. Well, he's new, you know, he's, and he's scary as shit. I mean, you got to think like, Part of it is, um, you know, I, I grew up, um, I grew up in New York city and my, my parents were, um, middle-class, like working middle-class until I was about 13. Like, and mm -hmm. my dad, he, when I was young, he was in the air force and then he went to medical school and then he was a doctor. 
and he became a doctor in the 80s, like right when I was, again, about like a teenager. And so suddenly we went from from being like, you know, middle, lower middle class to being wealthier. And it was a real shock, like a culture shock. Um, and I went to a high school after going to I went to a high school that was very sort of in New York City with like a lot of kids that, that were wealthier. And um, it was it was a lot to to take in, you know, at that time. And um, I'm very grateful for the education and all that stuff. And there were a lot of really nice kids. So I'm not shitting on, you know, rich kid schools, but there were there was also a level of insulation from with money that could also it sort of allows you to either sometimes you see it where it's like bubble wrapping someone in a way where if they don't have good qualities or they're not somebody that it just it's such an exponential like uh kind of reinforcer of that you know where it's like there's mm -hmm. no accountability no and all i'm trying to say is like for this like i have a real fascination with that and a real i like writing characters that are very powerful and very this and very dark because mm -hmm. It's fascinating to me when people are insulated by by wealth, like beyond our imagining, the things that they can do and get away with and how that warps you sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so this Joker is like that to the blackest degree. Mm -hmm. You know, you want murder islands, you can have murder islands. Like you can, and he's, you know, he's scary. He's really scary to me, you know, and he's cold. Like he's not, they say he's Joker because he doesn't laugh. And he laughs when he sees Batman, you'll see. He's like, but it's <laughs> Like he, he loves this little dude. Who's like, you seriously, you, you flee. Like I have like, he has like m all these businesses and part of the mystery of you'll see as this series progresses, like mm -hmm. you'll see it connects through some of his economics, the Joker and like some of the things Batman solves, you'll start to see mm -hmm. connect, connect to Alfred's plot. But like, it's, uh, he's spooky that way. And again, it's not like rich people, bad, you know, working mm -hmm. people, it's not that because there'll be other characters among him that you'll see or, you know, are good people that are, are um, uh, wealthy and so on. But mm -hmm. this guy is evil. Like Joker is evil. And it just shows how scary you can be when you have like unlimited resources and you're that way. He's sort of evil Bruce Wayne to me. He's like a mm -hmm. proxy. No, the flip is is definitely fascinating to me. So I was on the camp of I was glad the last page was there. <laughs> So nice. that's one more vote for the last page. But did you get the chance to create any new characters as well for this? Yeah, I did. There's um, in the second arc, you'll meet more of them. But, you know, I, I actually went back and forth with like before I settled on Black Mask or Roman. Did I want to create a brand new villain instead of Black Mask for that role? And I still kind of go back and forth in my head, like, should I have done someone brand new or but it just felt like to me at the earliest stage now we were changing so much about Bruce mm -hmm. that sort of bringing in somebody and doing almost a tweak on them where they would be a interesting, more dangerous version of themselves felt a little bit more like comfort food, but you know, poison comfort food in a fun <laughs> way for as a villain. So it was like doing that where I thought about it. I was like, do I just make someone new who's, I had this whole idea of like the dead apes and then they were going to be like this whole this whole nihilistic same kind of gang with the skulls but it wouldn't have mm -hmm. been him and it, this felt like let's ease them in let's ease everybody in like try and try and show them that the whole mythology is here and that we're gonna we're gonna play with like, everything what's the most difficult part about creating a new villain for batman it, it's just the it's the same thing with him it's just the pressure like he's so mm -hmm. he's the best villains gallery in all comics in my opinion him and spider-man you know and uh uh, it's just no offense, Superman or, <laughs> but like they're, they're so great because they're extensions of the things you can see that Batman is nervous about. Right. Like, so Joker is many things to him, you know, again, but to, to me, Joker is the representation of like whatever he's most afraid of appearing. It's like the bad reflection, but like two face is an extension of like his duality. You know what I mean? Like Batman's own sort of, tear over being two things at once and and you know the damage that does like penguin is like him his anxiety about being a rich guy you know it's this guy who mm -hmm. comes up and is like you know all you rich people up there that forget us in the sewers and so whatever variation there is like most of his great villains are these really deep 
really deep characters that have like a connection to what he's, you know, at, at core um, standing for. They're like an inverse of that or, you know, things that he hope is afraid of about himself. And so you've got to go to that level to like make a new one. That's the hard thing is like, mm -hmm. what do you think? Like, what do you, what are you really afraid of right now? So that was like, you know, Mr. Bloom creating him was really fun. The Court of Owls was really fun. James Jr. You know, all those, it was always like, I'll give you an example, like Dick Grayson, right? So Dick Grayson, mm -hmm. when Dick Grayson was Batman, it was like, well, what's Dick Grayson's greatest strength? You know, it's different than Bruce's. Dick is compassionate. He's a people person. He's an extrovert. He's social. He brings people together. He sees the best in people. So he's that. So I was like, well, how do I create a villain that would really be his Joker? Joker wouldn't freak, doesn't freak Dick Grayson out the same way. Mm -hmm. um, nor would Two Face, or those are built for Bruce. So what was, what do you build for him? Well, you build somebody with no compassion and no, that pretends to be that, that fakes it, and who you think is, who's someone who's so dark and believes that compassion is a weakness. Compassion is, you know, a vestigial thing that should be eliminated. And mm -hmm. so we should evolve into sociopaths. That's, and that's James Jr., you know, in that, in that Black Mirror arc was like, so that's the fun is trying to isolate the thing that you admire about the hero and then create something that's like, okay, this is why um, this villain is the opposite of that or the thing that's going to break that. And so that's kind of what Joker is to me in this, you know, mm. he's the Joker, so he's not a new character, but he's pretty new. You know what I mean? Like, he's definitely not the Joker I've written before. He's not mm -hmm. like... He's not like the pale clown, you know, scary dude with, you know, knives and axes. And he's this dude, he's just, you can't even get to him. He's so far, mm -hmm. you know, he's just scary because he could like put satellites over your <laughs> thing, watch you and drone kill you if he wanted. So he's, he's really spooky, you know, and he's super dark. Like he is, he's conscious however you would say he lacks a conscious i was like consciouslessness <laughs> so yeah do you like diving into like the dark side like that for the getting into the horror elements those are my favorite yeah i've always i don't know why i've always loved horror i was just my you know i've said it before but there was like a video store where i was growing up in the city called the video stop on 26th street and third avenue and they would not rent r-rated movies to kids but they would deliver to your house if you called <laughs> so it was like this neighborhood secret and we all rented everything that was like you know sleepaway camp 2 pumpkin head whatever like every bad horror movie um and what i learned i think at that age from a couple good ones that really freaked me out like night of the living dead was the first one that really scared the shit out of me weirdly because i was like this black and white this sucks um <laughs> Was that like horror when it's done right really feels like just like conflict burned down. Like, so it's like a shortcut, you know, it gets you there faster. Whereas like drama, you're beating around the bush in a great way. Like I love drama where you're figuring out what's wrong and you're dealing with it and talking with it. Horror is like the conflict has fangs and claws and it's coming to kill you. And it is like the thing that you're most afraid of right there. And as a kid that was really, um, nervous and had a lot of anxiety horror was a safe place to like experience those fears and come out so mm -hmm. it's taught me it's it's i love going there i mean i love uh, it's my favorite genre always will be for for the way that it allows me to dramatize the things i want the characters to face you know like mm -hmm. scaring them is my favorite where you're like can you scare batman how do you do that scare mm -hmm. superman so i think i always approach it from a horror angle even when it's not a horror story so how do you go about infusing those elements well with bruce it's easier because the city itself it's it's kind of it's built it's infused with that kind of tension and darkness and mm -hmm. i really love i mean again gotham to me my thesis on gotham from really early on from like gates of gotham and detective comics and it's the thesis of that black mirror story and then carries over into batman is that the city is this great antagonist right like it it the way new york is like you you go to the city to become the thing you want to be right that's what people do with most cities and uh can you hear that woodpecker or no you can't hear it right mm -mm, no i can't hear it here i'm sorry did i break yeah. up 
just for a moment. <laughs> what was the last thing I said? Woodpecker. <laughs> so, yeah, said, Do you hear that? Wood There's a woodpecker banging on this wall. And I had to punch the wall and now it's gone. But the it'll probably come back. It loves my son. I'm in my son's room, by the way. This is not my room. I don't have like a gold chain gaming chair and a <laughs> bad news bears, and a, but it's an awesome room. And <laughs> but uh, I didn't, my office is, it's cold today here in New York and I didn't put the heat on in my office. So I'm, I'm being a baby, but um, yeah, the, you know, the thing I love about Gotham is like, like most cities like New York, like people go there to become the people they want to be right. Like you, mm -hmm. you, leave where you live to go to the city to transform yourself into, you know, the person that you hope to become. And that city throws things at you that are really hard and says, leave, I'm not going to give in. Like these streets are hard. The buildings are hard. You know, there's no comfort leave. Mm -hmm. And you have got to find a way through that to, you know, find your people, find yourself. And if you do that, you kind of come out the other side really proud. And that's what Gotham is, except it's like a, wild like comic book version of that where instead of like challenges like your rent is high it'll be like here's a crazy murderous villain that's coming at you that you didn't know would you know and so I love that about the city um and it also allows me to do the thing you're asking about where I feel like it's just built for horror it's built for that kind of darkness because it's sort of like mm -hmm. oh you think you're gonna make it here you think you're gonna become Batman you think you're gonna be Robin or Batgirl or Signal or any of it, well, let me throw at you something that you, you're you probably not going to get over. But secretly, the city, I think Gotham is not an mm -hmm. evil place. I feel Gotham is like, wants you to, to get through it. It wants the trial by fire, you know? Do you find that working in horror and through horror, do you find it cathartic? Do you find that it helps with your anxieties? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, that's why, like, you know, you can read my stuff in that context pretty easily. Like death of the, like, all right, well, Court of Owls, right? Like, so Court of Owls is about a guy who's like, Batman is just getting confident. He's really confident in Gotham. And then the entire history of the city comes to life and is like, you're nothing. And I'm, we're going to kill you now. And like, I was on Dick Grayson who I was like, oh, you know what? This is scary. But I fell in love writing Dick Grayson. I, he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm afraid to be Batman. And it was great because it was how I felt. And then all of a sudden I'm on Bruce Wayne and it, the whole history of Batman is like staring me in the face of like every story that inspired me. So it was like, oh, the Court of Owls. And then more personally, like witches and death of the family are written at the same time when we were pregnant with our second son, whose room this is. And, um, I was, my career was taking off and I was like, you know what? Like there's really part of me that worries that I'm not going to be a good dad this time or that I'm not a good dad because I care a lot about my work and I never thought I'd get these opportunities. Never. Like I never thought I'd get Batman or if I got Batman, it would be 20 years after I started. I got it first year. Mm -hmm. So it was like this, this incredible like anger where it was like, I want to be with my family, but I also, this is my one chance. And if I fuck this up and don't do a good job on this and don't put everything I have into it, I'll never get this chance again. And that story, Death of the Family, is the Joker literally coming to Batman being like, you don't really want a family. You just want to go back to being me and you. You want to be young again and be the two of us and do this forever without any of that. So horror, and that's a straight up horror story. And witches mm -hmm. is similar, which is about, you know, creatures that come out of the ground and take away your children and eat them. But usually because you pledge them to the, <laughs> to the creatures. So it's pretty right on my sleeve, but the, you know, e each one of the arcs that I've done on Batman is that kind of a thing where it's, you scratch the surface and I can tell you why um, I was writing about that thing. And they're all taken from a horror event that way. It really does help me. I, I'm a big believer in like facing the things you're most afraid of on the page. And that's what mm -hmm. makes great stuff not that i've written great stuff but i mean my favorite stuff is clearly by my friends is when i know they're wrestling with the things that keep them up at night and going there you know for james tynan like does it all the time jeff lemire does it J jason aaron like the people that i gravitate towards and artists too like jock and greg and you know and nick now it's it's fun you know that's you you, you band together and be like go there jock is the one that always was the first person to really 
push me that way when we did witches and I was like, I don't know if I can put this stuff in here about how bad the dad got when, you know, he first had a kid because I went through, you know, rough times when we had our first kid and wasn't sure if I was, you know, going to be a good dad or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And was like, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. And he was like, if you take that out of the book, I'm not doing the book. <laughs> I was like, and those early lessons were great. So yeah, I love horror because that's where I just think it's so pure Mm -hmm. When it's done well, it's like you going in there and really dealing with the shit that you don't want to look at, you know? When you put yourself out there like that, though, what's it like then to see that come back and be interpreted if it's so personal? It's really, well, I mean, I'm most afraid of like more like, I think I'm actually more, I'm more nervous about like my kids growing up and reading it and then me explaining to them like, this is, you know, you're like how I felt because, you know, you might like... It, I don't know, you know, like I'm now I'm all like worried about it. I'm like, <laughs> actually, I hope they're not listening uh, because that, you know, I do try and just put myself on the page that way. I don't write about them, you know, that mm -hmm. way. But so it's hard. Like, I mean, but I'll tell you this, like, there's no better feeling like witches was a really special experience for me because I wrote these essays in the back also about stuff. And I really tried to be a, very like this is what this book is about and um the response i got from people not in terms of even like sales or any of that but like just reaching out and to this day that book i still get people writing about like you know just they it was nice to see on the page because they felt that way and they had mm -hmm. kids and you know it's hard it's hard to be like what if i'm bad at this what if i don't want this what if i screwed up what if i'm you know, but we all, I'm not everybody. I'm sure there are plenty of people who never feel that way, but I don't think it's totally uncommon to feel that way sometimes. And there's no better feeling than putting yourself on the page and trying to do something that's like, does anyone else feel this way? And this is my exploration of that. And then having mm -hmm. someone reach out to you personally and say, this mattered to me. That's, mm -hmm. that's genuinely to me what writing the core thing about the desire to write is about. It's, it's connecting with other people and saying, am I totally alone in this or does somebody else feel this way like out there in the world? And mm -hmm. sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But, you know, or sometimes you screw up the message <laughs> on the telling of it. But ultimately, it's a, it's, it's a scary feeling on the way out and it's a fantastic feeling on the way in when, if it works, you know, somebody mm -hmm. reaches, even one person, even if one person like reaches out and is like, I felt this way, you know, and you're like, oh, hopefully, you know, that can be enough sometimes. Mm -hmm. No, have, but... <laughs> have you had anybody start to reach out about Absolute Batman yet? I mean, like just, yeah, like, I mean, about the shooting and about, yes, there are Oh, there have been messages so far and people just saying they're really excited to see some of the stuff included that they're afraid of for their kids and things like that. So it's been really, really rewarding. I'm trying not to read too much of the stuff coming in. I, I try and like be selective about it because it's easy to go down rabbit holes, good and bad. I think mm -hmm. like there's some people I really trust who I know will be honest with me and you try and keep a really good relationship about making sure they feel comfortable being truthful with you um, mm -hmm. about it. And that's that's kind of what I go for. It's been really interesting watching the evolution and the response to all of it. And I'm excited to see it keep going. And I would love to talk more about it, but we're running a bit late on time for me. So. Oh, sure, sure. I, again, any anything. Uh, I'm so, again, I'm so grateful, Sasha, to be able to chat with you about it and for everything you do on the channel and all of it. It's great. No, thank you. And thank you for the kind words. This time I can respond and not freeze up like I did last time. So no, I, I, I feel bad. I was watching our interview. I was like, I talked, like I was so nervous. I like nervously talked the entire time. So I was like determined this time to be like less, less like blah, 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 blah. That's and funny. I came in. I was like, I didn't talk enough. I was like, this time I'll talk more. So we met in the middle. So that's we good. met in the middle. We met in the middle. Next time we can flip and I'll just give yes and no <laughs> answers and you just go for it. So. Just keep going about random YouTube things. <laughs> right? Exactly. It'll be good. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I hope everybody checks out Absolute Batman and Absolute Wonder Woman and DC All In, Absolute Superman, just everything. Check it all out. Do all the things. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say thank you to you and thank you to like everybody out there showing support for not just our book, but like you said, all the books. And seriously, go support Marvel, go support Image and IDW. Like the fun things, like what you said at the beginning, is it feels like a really energized and exciting time at comics and it's just starting. It feels like it's this moment that's building. So tell mm -hmm. your friends, like go to the stores. They need like right now they're they're on the upswing. And even with this stuff we're trying to do with the Justice League cards. We're trying to get people back into like a weekly buying habit of going in there and enjoying being in the store just because it feels like fans want to be in the store every week and retailers want you in there and it's awesome. So mm -hmm. yeah, just tell friends about how great comics are in general. It doesn't have to be ours or DC or anything and go out and go out and celebrate them. Exactly. Go out and read some comics. Yeah. <laughs> As always, thanks must everyone who made it to the end. Thanks to Scott for dropping by and talking Absolute Batman and more. Please share all your thoughts down below. Check out Absolute Batman if you haven't already. Share some things you're excited for down below. Thanks so much for taking some time to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.